Hello, and welcome to today's webinar, Coco TV. Use Python and bring joy back to verification. I'm your host, Richard Warrillow, part of Aldec's technical marketing team. Aldec has been a leader in the EDA industry since 1984. The company delivers innovative design creation, simulation, verification, and prototyping solutions to assist in the development of complex FPGA, ASIC, system on chip, and embedded systems design. In this webinar, we will provide an overview of COCO-TB, the co-routine-based co-simulation test bench environment for verifying VHDL and Verilog RTL using Python. We'll also illustrate how COCO-TB encourages the same philosophy of design reuse and randomized testing as UVM, but implemented in Python rather than system Verilog. We'll then whet your appetite by showing you how to get started with a small design using Aldex Riviera Pro before showing you a more complex example by way of illustrating how much value CocoTB can bring to your projects. Should you have any questions during the presentation and demonstration you're about to see, we invite you to use the questions panel on the right-hand side of your screen. We would also like to let you to know to expect emailed instructions after this webinar to view an online recording of today's presentation along with today's slides. Today's presenter is Philip Wagner co-maintainer of CocoTB and hardware software engineer at Low Risk in Cambridge in the United Kingdom, where he is involved in OpenTitan, the first open source root of trust chip. For many years, Philip has been working on the intersection of digital hardware, software, and open source. He is passionate about developer productivity, communities, and bridging the gap between hardware and software development methodologies. Philip has an MSc and PhD, Doctor of Engineering, degree in electrical, Engineering from Technical University Munich, Germany, and is founding director of the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation. Philip, welcome. Thank you, Richard, for the introduction, and welcome to everybody who listens in and has a look at this uh, web podcast today. We're going to have a look at CocoDB today, and uh, as we have heard, a way to bring joy back to verification. And I'm very happy to present this um, webinar today. The piece we're gonna start with is the central one. The central one being that verification is software. Verification is software, meaning we should write verification code like we write software in a high level language that gives us productivity. We say in the CocoDB world, Python is this language that enables you to be productive in your verification code. So if we have a look at the next slide, people sometimes are slightly scared of CocoDB. It might take away their, their favorite toy or in internet terms uh, will scare their kitten. And uh, also people have often said to us, what is CocoDB? Is it a parrot or is it a coconut or is it a coconut tree or something like that? It's none of the above. Uh, but to make sure that you all can sleep well tonight, CocoTB isn't a parrot, won't scare your cat. It's integrating nicely with your existing ecosystem of verification and hardware development and um, will bring benefit to your next verification project or maybe already brings benefit to your current verification project. So today, um, after a short introduction about me, um, so that you know who's actually speaking to you, we're gonna have a look at CocoDB and start at the very basics. So if you have used CocoDB before, you might find that slightly boring. If not, you'll find interesting information of how to get initially started. And we use that example obviously as a kind of dumbed down test bench, but it is important to explain the basic concepts of CocoDB. Uh, we will do this example of getting started uh, using Riviera Pro. So you'll see how Riviera Pro integrates very nicely with CocoDB and the two work together. Um, we'll then have a look at a couple selected examples that kind of show you how you can use CocoDB going beyond obviously a trivial starting point. We'll have a look at some basics of how to use CocoDB at a bus boundary, a recommended way of using many verification approaches. Uh, we're going to have a look at the topic of coverage. We're going to have a look at the topic of constrained random. And um, I'll show some projects that use CocoDB and some inspirations that might be beneficial or 
might provide a starting point for your next verification project. And of course, if you have any questions and would like to get answers for those, post them either in the chat window that is uh, potentially visible to you, or otherwise uh, drop me an email afterwards um, through one of the many communication channels that we have. So let's have a look at the next slide. I have already been introduced, so um, just that's a picture of me in pre-corona times when uh, I was more cleanly shaven than I am today. Um, the important thing to note here is that I'm having an all-day job at Lower Risk CSE. We do hardware design and we do verification. We do this verification in um, standard UVM technologies, but we're also exploring other ways to do verification. We do hardware design in the open source space, and this is something that is unique and um, also works very well with um, PokerTV, which is also open source. And we'll get to that in a second. The other thing to note from that is uh, PokerDB is used in industry, it is used in academia, it is used uh, obviously by hobbyists as well, um, but there is a very strong user base in, in industry and academia. Um, but still all the project that, uh, all the, the PokerDB project is done effectively by pe people volunteering their time um, or their employer volunteering some of their time. As the same approach that you would have, for example, in the Linux kernel or other open source projects. Let's have a look at the next slide to give you an introduction to CocoDB. So we already had seen it's not a bird, but on the next slide we actually see what CocoDB really is. So first of all, it is a RTL simulator plugin. The last word is important after the parentheses. It is a plugin that plugs into your existing simulator that you have. That is Riviera Pro, for example, that is Active HDL and many others. And that's the second part of CokeDB. It is a Python library for writing verification test bench code. Because writing that in pure Python is probably something that uh, needs a bit more help from a framework. How do those two things fit together. We'll see that on the next slide in the form of a small block diagram. And the blocks in this block diagram are massive. And let's start on the right side. We have on the right side in orange the RTL simulator, so your Riviera Pro or Active HDL, as you have it installed. And this simulator simulates your RTL code, so your system very log of the HDL code or whatever your simulator might support, also mixed language, whatever. As I said, the simulator supports it's running in your simulator. And then on the left side, you have your test bench code. So that's the code you write in Python, and that's the code that will benefit from CocoDB. So we somehow need to bridge the gap between the left side and the right side. And this bridge is CocoDB, first of all. It connects to the simulator through standardized interfaces that um, almost all simulators support. Those are called uh, VPI for Verilog code and VHPI for um, VHDL code and FLAI if you use a mental simulator. And the other thing that CocoDB provides beyond this communication channel is the library that you see in, as a green box on the left. And this is the piece of code that makes it easy to write verification code in Python and to access those pieces of your design that runs in the simulator. Sounds all very abstract for the moment, but we'll see in the example later on how that actually works in practice, because code can explain significantly more than a block diagram as we see it here. So before we dive into that, let's have a look at the next slides for some of the key benefits that CocoDB can bring to your project. First of all, it brings you verification in a highly productive language, that is Python. It is a software language, so you can use all the techniques and learnings that we have had in the, in the software development community over, over the decades and years, and all of those benefits are available when you write your verification code. The world has written significantly more software and hardware code, and there has been a lot of stuff learned over the course of those years. Um, Python gives you them right at your fingertips. 
PlugaDB also makes it very easy to interface with existing infrastructure. So it's not either use CocoDB or use something else. And if you use CocoDB, you need to throw everything over the wall and start from scratch. That's not how development projects work. You always have existing pieces that you need to put together, that you need to glue together, that you can actually make sure that you can focus on the bits and pieces that make your product unique. Those pieces can be golden models that you already have for your um, designs that you want to um, implement in, in the HTL or Verilog in the end. Those can be existing simulators, simulators you bought, you produced yourself. Those can be MATLAB simulations. Those can be any type of model that you might have. And it's super easy to interface that with CocoDB. The other thing it interfaces very nicely with is existing hardware or real hardware, actually. So this is especially relevant if you're working in an FPGA environment or an environment where you simulate parts of your design and have others actually running in, in real hardware, where you have systems that communicate, which is obviously totally normal. So interfacing with those pieces of real hardware is something that is really easy in Python because there are many libraries existing and we'll see an example of that in a second. No, not in a second, but in a couple of minutes. The third key benefit that we get out of CocoDB is the ability to grow as you go. As I said before, it's not a CocoDB or the rest of the world. It's use CocoDB in a small part of your design, a small part of your verification challenge, and then scale it up if you want to scale it up. There is no fixed methodology that you have to use and that you need to spend weeks or months to learn before you actually can write your first line of productive code. So you can start small and explore and just make sure that you use the parts that bring most benefit to your project. CocoDB is free and open source. It's free as in terms of money. It's also free as in terms of free and open source. It uh, is free to reuse. You can um, make modifications to it and um, you're allowed to actually not share those verifications with somebody else, if, um, modifications with somebody else if you don't want to, even though obviously you're very much encouraged to do so. And this encouragement also comes from the very active and friendly community that we have around CocoDB. So you can find all discussions and code on uh, GitHub and chat channels, where it's very easy to find um, help and suggest improvements, report bugs, and actually follow up. There are a couple downsides as well because no benefits slide, I think, can be uh, well trusted if there are no downsides. CokeDB is, even though it's not young, it's um, I think slightly over five years old and it's heavily used in industry, um, it is still not the technology that has produced a lot of verification IP that you can buy off the shelf. There is a lot of stuff out in the internet that you can reuse. But we, you will have a hard time finding a probably existing vendor that sells you a lot of verification IP prepackaged for CocoDB. Of course, the hope is that this webinar is one of the re, um, reasons why this might change. Um, and there are less training resources than for UVM, for example. This is also something we are obviously trying to address and that you're all um, welcome to join. Um, but with that, let's actually do our first bit of training resource by having a look at the next slide. Why I think and we think that Python is a good idea to write verification in. First of all, it's productive to write and easy to read. Code is significantly more often read than it is written. But still, productive writing is important. Um, the lines of code that you type down are important. So Python is well known in this domain to be a very good trade-off. It's easy to interface with. We have seen that before. Um, it taps into a in, um, existing ecosystem that allows you to reuse simulations, um, golden models, things like that, 
that you might already have and that is easy to integrate within uh, with Python. It has a huge existing ecosystem of libraries and those libraries, it's important to know, don't always need to be the piece of verification IP that you would consider a kind of library in the pure hardware domain. Libraries are also something that just reads out a trace file, for example, and prepares them in a way that makes them um, accessible to then drive your device under test. So those pieces of code that you either have a hard time interfacing to system Verilog or um, need to write a lot of tickle and DPI C or C++ for example for. There's a lot of stuff in Python that you can just use, download and integrate into your system and be done within a couple lines of code. And those pieces of code are high quality. Python is used very widely in the industry. It's interpreted, so you can leave your simulator open while you make changes to your verification code. And as we see also to your um, hard HDL code. So this gives you a huge boost in productivity if you don't need to rejiggle all the waves yeah, and save them and restore them, for example. And it's a very popular language. You shouldn't underestimate how hard it is to find verification engineers that are fluent in UVM, for example. Um, it's significantly easier. That's at least the experience I had, and that's the experience that we have actually got as a feedback from many people that use CodeDB. It's much easier to find a hardware design that is very good in system variable of VHDL and has a bit of Python background and teach them CodeDB and get into the verification domain. So let's have a look at the next slide to see who's actually behind CodeDB. What is CodeDB about? So it's not a commercial company. It is an open source project as um, many open source projects are decentralized and community controlled. Think Linux kernel, for example. It is an open source project uh, under the three clause BSD license. So you're free to use and modify it for any purpose that you want. Um, it is as a community control. So you um, participate if you want to participate under equals. So whoever does the most has more to say. There is a group of maintainers who make sure that uh, we stick to our processes that we gave ourselves, that we have a level playing ground for everybody who wants to get involved. But it's important to know you can become a maintainer too. And we've seen a couple of people being added to um, the list of maintainers at recent times by simply contributing massively and making Coco to be significantly better for everybody. And the world as we live in, unfortunately or fortunately, um, needs always a bit of legal and financial framework to actually function. And this function or this function is taken over by the FOSSI Foundation. It is again a kind of community controlled foundation, similar to what you could expect with the Linux Foundation, just different. Um, it takes care of the legal and financial issues that might arise, contracts, donations, funding of some kind, and makes sure that the assets of the of CodeDB, for example, the domain name and other things are kept safe and kept in the hands of the community. So let's have a look at the next slide of how we can actually integrate CocoDB and Riviera Pro and how we can get started. And we'll start from the very basics that we see on the next slide. What do you need to have to actually make use of CocoDB? First of all, you need a PC with Windows, Linux and Mac. Um, so I would expect there are not that many Mac users under the hardcore hardware developers, but CodeDB is usable there. Um, it is usable under Windows and obviously usable under Linux. It requires Python 3.5. That's a recent, more or less recent change since um, the upcoming release of CodeDB, um, which gives us a couple of nice benefits. There are all the releases of CodeDB that still support Python 2, so if you're stuck with that, um, first talk to your department to convince them that upgrade is a good idea. Um, if not, there is the older version of CodeDB still available and usable. You need a Python development packages. Those are typically installed with the Python, so that's not a challenge at all. You need a, a C and C++ compiler. You need GNU Make, at least for the standard way of running simulations. There are other alternatives that um, might be more interested, uh, interesting for um, the more sophisticated users of CodeDB. 
and ultimately you need something to actually run your design under test with and this is a very local bhdl simulator depending on what kind of source code you want to simulate Riviera Pro and Active HDL are both supported and work very well. So with that out of the way, you probably have a PC in front of you that already fulfills those requirements. What do we need to do next to install CoffeeDB? And this is something that we see in the next slide and has improved a lot over the cycle of the last, between the last two releases of CoffeeDB. So now CocoDB is a simple Python package that you install like all of the Python package you might be interested in through pip. And in the slide here, we have a example that uses the current master, that's the current development version of CocoDB. And I'm gonna use that since there is a 1.4 release of CocoDB planned in the next coming days. Um, but it's not out there yet, but I still want to make sure that I show you on those slides the latest and greatest improvements of CoffeeDB. So when you actually give it a try in the next coming days, CoffeeDB 1.4 should be released and you can make uh, use of all those examples that you see. Um, so that's a kind of short remark on that. So let's have a look at the next slides on the ingredients we need to simulate a design with CoffeeDB. First of all, we obviously need to design on a test. The code you already have, very local VHDL, as I said before. We need to test code that is written in Python, and we'll have a look at that in a second, how this actually looks. And we need a piece of glue to start the simulator and integrate with the Python code, start CoffeeDB and all of that. And that's in this example here, a make file. Let's have a look at the next slide, how the design on the test looks. And the design on the test for this super trivial demo is also a super trivial design on the test, but still shows the important first couple properties of CoffeeDB. It's a FIFO, insists a Verilog, so VHDL works the same, but I'm just most familiar with Verilog or System Verilog. So the examples are with that. You have a clock, you have a reset, you have a data input, write enable a full signal, and the output side as well, data out, read enable, uh, and an empty. And as we'll see in a second, so this is a standard FIFO, so it has a delay of one cycle to actually get the output after you enable the read enable. Standard FIFO, I omitted the implementation here. Let's have a look at the next slide of how a trivial test bench could look that actually makes use of this design on the test. And this is, and I need to have stressed the fact here, we're trying to introduce CocoDB here. So this is the first most trivial thing you probably could do with CocoDB is create a clock. And I uh, also should note that creating a clock within CocoDB is probably not the thing you want to do in the long term. But let's stick with it for now and have a look at the piece of Python code that we see in front of us. So we start at obviously almost the top. So we see a async dev test create clock function. And we already see that this is a function that takes a single input variable, a single input argument that's a DOT the device under test. On top of that function, we see that's at cocodb.test thingy, which is in Python called the decorator. And this decorator makes sure that First of all, CocoDB recognizes this function as being a test. You might have seen similar approaches in unit test frameworks or in software world um, that also decorate functions like that. And the second thing this decorator does is it makes sure that this DUT variable is actually injected into the function so that we get this variable. Um, the third thing we see if we look at a function signature is it is marked as an async asynchronous function. This is a Python 3 piece of functionality um, that is used or needed because uh, we're going to use some other async functionality as we go down in the piece of code and already see the await statement below. And if you have ever done anything with Node.js or similar frameworks, you're obviously very used to um, that kind of coding style. 
So let's have a look. First of all, we see the first line is the clock equals dot clock. So this is maybe the the first piece of magic that, if you've never had a look at CocoDB, is highly interesting. The DOT is, as you might have guessed, your top-level design that you're simulating the device in the test. And then we have the dot clock, dot CLK. This is accessing a signal in your device at the test. And the good thing here is you didn't have to specify that anywhere. You didn't have to say, oh, I want to make this clock signal available or I want to feed it through to PokerTP. PokerTP automatically maps all the signals you have on all the ports you have in your hardware design and not just on the top level hierarchy, but down the hierarchy as well, and makes them all available under this DOT variable. So you can access all the signals, everything you have in design right through this DOT thing, and you don't need to do anything for it. The second thing here is those DOT.clock variables, once you access them, they're references. So it's not the current value of the clock, but it's actually a reference to the clock signal. So you can freely assign them to whatever you want. And in this case, we assign them to a variable named clock. So far, so boring, but also so exciting. Now let's have a look at the lines below there, and that's a standard Python loop um, that iterates for 10 times. And first of all, we assign this clock variable the value of one. And you see this interesting, kind of not very Python-y looking, smaller than equals one. So this is a syntax that is provided by CocoDB, and it's intended to look a bit like HDL, like Verilog, not the HDL. And it's an assignment to assign the clock signal, actually the value of this clock signal, the value of one. And you see already in the purple shadow box there that this is a shorthand to um, assign this, this value to this uh, clock reference. What we do next is we're still here in the, in the Python domain. Oh, we need to go back one slide, sorry. Um, we're still in the Python domain, um, but we have now executed Python code iteratively one after the other. We now want to actually make sure that uh, clock toggles, so we need to give back control to the simulator. And that's what we do with this await statement and timer. So it already reads quite normally, as you would expect, so await for one nanosecond, and this is exactly what it does. So now, as soon as we put this await statement in there, we leave the Python domain and we hand back control to the simulator. Now Riviera Pro can go and simulate the design on a test for one nanosecond. And once it has done that, whatever that implies, however long that might take in simulation time, we get control back on a Python side. Now, once we're back there, we just repeat the same thing. So we assign the value zero to the clock, wait for another nanosecond and start the loop all over again. So what we get in the end is a clock signal of two nanoseconds period or in this case, just 10 uh, cycles. So let's have a look at the next slide, how we can simulate this design. I said we need a small piece of makefile, and that's the one we're gonna use for this demo. Uh, we do have the very log sources specified. Uh, we do specify the language of the top level design. We do specify the name of the top level and the name of the module in Python that we will uh, use and that contains our test bench code. That's the stuff we've just seen. And finally, we include a CocoDB provided make file that essentially does all the rest of the magic. And we'll see how that magic looks in a second. Um, but sufficient to know here is it provides us all the other make file targets to run your simulator of choice, to run them in GUI mode or not, and make sure that all your simulators effectively are encapsulated in a way that you don't need to worry about how to call those. The other important thing to know is these make files are a convenient option to get started, but I know very well that uh, as soon as you have started a slightly larger hardware design project, you'll probably 
um, invested a lot in a random collection of tickle scripts, in a random collection of make and uh, other bad files that effectively you call build system. And um, CocoDB is totally able and it's easier than ever with the current 1.4 release to integrate CocoDB in your existing um, build system. And you can use the make files that we provide as an example. But ultimately what you need to do is just load a single compiled library that is pre-compiled. Uh, when you install CocoDB, load that in your simulator and that's it. So let's have a look at the next for, for, um, slide, how actually all of that looks if we put it to action. I did say that the make files provide all the magic and you can see one possible way to call the make file at the top of this slide. And what we're going to do here is call CocoDB in batch mode. So the unattended mode you will use for your nightly regressions. We have the make and sim equals Riviera. So that's the first thing we need to do is specify a simulator to use. Another option here would be active HDL among others. And then we say we want to first clean out all old build artifacts and then start a new, new simulation. And what you then see is, as you see in the screenshot below, and if you used Riviera Pro before, you'll recognize some of the messages and you probably recognize most of the ones at the top of the screen. That's the kernel and the other kernel messages you see. So this is effectively when Riviera Pro is done elaborating and compiling your design and hands over to CocoDP to do its initialization. And you see that there as well, you see the um, CocoDP version that we're using, you see the River, Riviera Pro version that is being used. And then you see something that looks very much like if you run a unit test in software. So you see the tests that are being executed, you see where in the Python code this log message came from, and in the end you see a summary of the tests that passed or potentially failed. You get all this information obviously in textual output as you see right here, but you also get the same information in a file called results.xml. This is a standard X unit style or J unit style um, file marking pass and fail test cases. All halfway normal CI systems like Jenkins or GitLab CI or others do support those test um, output files. So if you have a CI system like that, you can just plug that in. You do not need any additional glue code. You do not read, uh, need to write your own way of parsing CSV files to get the, the output and transform it in a way that your CI system understands them. CookDB gives you that pre-packaged and ready to use without, as we've seen, any magic here. If we look at the next slide, we see that CocoDB is not only usable in batch mode, obviously, but you also want to develop your tests and see what actually happens in, in, with waveforms. So if you look at the top, we see that we slightly modified the way to call CocoDB. So we see still the makes in Riviera, and we added two options here. That's the GUI equals one and waves equals one. Those as the name implies, and you probably guessed, I mean, let's start a user interface, reference user interface, and let's record some waveforms. And those instructions are being passed on to Riviera. And what we then see if we start uh, um, type that command, we see Riviera starting. And then if we press the green run button, we see the output that we see on the screen right now. We see, as I said, on top the waves. And at the bottom, you might recognize that from before. That's the test output we've seen on a console before. Now, if you make any kind of change to your Python code, you do not need to close Riviera. Leave it open. Just use your editor, change your Python code, and then click restart and click run again. And you'll see updated waves and you see the updated tests at the bottom. If you ever make changes to your hardware design, which you probably will do, otherwise um, it would be a pretty boring verification project, um, 
you need to make sure that Riviera knows that and recompiles and re-elaborates your design. You do that by clicking simulation and reinvoke. This will just recompile all your sources and then you still see the changes that you made. The good thing here again, all your wave configuration stays the way it is. You do not need to leave and close Riviera in between. Once you're happy with all of that, you're of course free to use the batch mode again since that's pre-configured and already working. Submit your the work uh, to nightly regression runs or whatever you might be doing and be ready to move on to the next challenge. The next challenge here being obviously us wanting to do something more interesting than a clock generation and we'll see in the next slide how a very trivial verification project might start out. In this case, let's do a manual test. There's not really verification, it's just a bit of manual direct test of a FIFO. And the first thing we do, we're gonna do is get this clock generation out of the way and use a convenience functionality that CokeDB provides us. And this is the, the clock class that we see being used here in the circled line of code. And we pass this clock class the signal that we want to drive with. Uh, that's DOT.clock. Uh, we give it a period and we give it the clock, uh, also a unit for that period. And then we start the clock and make sure that we fork it off to run in the background. So we get it out of the way. It is now run in the background, kind of. So what it does is effectively the same as we've seen in this previous example, just continues to run for as long as you want, uh, or as long as you have the, the test running. Then we do some, uh, a bit of reset to our device under test. Uh, we've already seen the functionality to drive signals. So we set the D in to zero, write enable, read enable to zero. We set the reset to one. And now we see another trigger in the await rising edge line. We've seen the timer trigger before, and CocoDB provides the timer trigger in addition to a rising edge trigger, a falling edge trigger, and a edge trigger. And the important thing to know is, even though they're called rising edge and falling edge, you can use them on any kind of signal. So whenever you have a transition from zero to one, one to zero, or whatever, um, if you go for the edge trigger, then this is the right trigger to use. So you can also use that on a valid signal, for example, on a ready signal, on an empty signal for a five four. We'll see that in a second. So, okay, we wait for two cycles, and then we set the reset to zero. Okay, our device and the test is reset. On the next slide, we see how to actually drive some data and read it back. And first of all, we write here in this example, the value 42 into the data in, we wait for a cycle, and then we see another construct that we have not seen before. That's the dot underscore log dot info. That's how you can produce those nice log messages that we have seen before in the in the output. It also shows you one more thing: is how to actually get not a just a handle reference to the signal you're interested in, but the value of that signal. So you add dot value to it, and that's um, and then the current value at this point in the simulation of the empty signal. And we can of course compare that, test that, and in this case, we just wait until the FIFO is not empty anymore, and then we continue. Um, in this case, we do next a read enable, read the data word, wait for a rising edge, set read enable to zero, and then in this case, we need to, want, uh, to wait for a cycle since we have a bit of latency in our FIFO. And then finally, last line here is actually the, the line that makes a test a test, is we assert on the value of the D out and make sure that this is equal to the one we wrote in. So that's 42 in this case. If this assert is violated, you get a test failure and you see that in your console screen and you see the test is being failed. And um, you also obviously see a Python style stack trace, um, which is not a bad thing in this case, it just shows you where the test failure came from. Going to the next slide, let's have a look at how we can further build on top of that. 
So what we've done up to now is a very manual way of writing a single P word into the file and reading it back. Um, that's not what we're going to do forever. So we want to have a producer, we want to have a consumer, and we want to have them decoupled to make sure we write into the pipeline and read stuff back. And for that, we typically create individual coroutines. And we've seen the first coroutine with the clock coroutine before. Um, but you can create your own. And in this case, we have a write thread and read thread, producer and a consumer. And ultimately, we wait until they're both done and join them together. If we have on our next slide, a look at how you could write your own coroutine. And this is, again, a trivial example, but um, actually a good one to get started. First of all, we need to have a kind of a scoreboard, a mirroring data structure where we actually keep track of the data we've written into our FIFO and the stuff we expect to read back. Second thing we see is the async dev write FIFO uh, function. What do you see here, or better, what you don't see here is a decorator of any kind. But what you still see is a async function. So coroutines are normal async functions in the current version of CocoDB. And um, you now can use all the bits and pieces you've seen before to write values into the file. One interesting piece that is interesting, um, well, kind of interesting piece of information is that you can't only access signals or ports, you can also access very large parameters in the design hierarchy. And this is very convenient if you want to parameterize, in this case, our FIFO. So to read the, the width of this FIFO and make use of that to create the right number of uh, randomness. Um, looking at the next slide, we see one more example of, um, actually no, so if you go, sorry, if you go back for one slide, this is effectively the, the basic functionality that these are the basic blocks you need to write your own pieces of CocoDB test bench. And these are kind of sufficient to get you started and kind of grow from there. Um, if you have used CocoDB before, um, you might first of all be have been slightly bored because there were concepts that you've already seen. But then if you go to the next slide, um, there are also some pieces of syntax that you might not have seen before. Since Python 3.5, we can now make more use of async functions. And this is something that um, we leverage in the upcoming release of Python 1, uh, CocoDB 1.4. We also significantly rework the build system. So you've seen some install instructions uh, that are significantly easier than what you might have been used to before. And many syntax improvements. And some of them are the ones you've seen in this um, on our previous slides. You can use async now, and you're um, encouraged to use async now. And you see a comparison of the old and new syntax on the slide here. Also, what you've seen is CodeDB, those coroutine decorators sprinkled across your code base all over the place. You can remove all those and just make them async. Important to note here is you're not required to switch over both Variants of the syntax are still supported, equally supported. You can mix and match, but you're encouraged to switch over to the new syntax since that gives you actually a couple of nice benefits that of things that you have had a hard time doing in the previous syntax. With that out of the way, let's have a look at some more advanced uh, ways of using CocoDB. And first of all, we did see a trivial test bench before that used CocoDB to drive signals directly. In a more advanced test bench, you're probably going to do a verification on the bus boundary transaction level verification stuff. And if you look at the next slide, we see some of the basic building blocks that CocoDB provides in its core to actually make use of that functionality. And those are the ones you would totally expect. So there is a bus, which is a collection of signals. There's a driver to write those signals. There's a monitor to observe them. And there's a scoreboard. Those are base classes. You're encouraged to use them and build on top of them. And building on top of them are real bosses or real abstractions. And we see a couple of those on the next slide. Some of them are shipped with CocoDB. 
HL4 Lite and HL4 uh, Avalon and XGMII are the ones that are currently in the CalcDB um, core base. These are rather arbitrary, I'd say, mostly for historical reasons, um, but there are many others available out there as well. And if you Google a bit around, you're going to find a lot of them and potentially the one that is actually the right one that is missing in your project. There's a Wishbone one, there's a SPI one, there's an AXI Stream one, and uh, many others that might be useful. So just have a look in the internet. Important thing to note here as well, there is no need for that to actually be packaged and shipped with CocoDB. So you're free to pick up whatever you want, and there is um, actually no technical reason to integrate it very deeply. And it works equally well either way. Good. One question that um, we get regularly if we look at the next slide is what about coverage? How do you do coverage? And typically that's already the start of the confusion. You can, but well, coverage means something different to everybody uh, who actually thinks about coverage. The first thing, a piece of coverage that you might be interested in is the coverage of your Python code. So how much of your test code is actually ever being executed? Um, this coverage code is connected through standard Python mechanisms, uh, PyCoverage, coverage. And you can get that by simply typing coverage equals one to your make command. And then you get a nice HTML view and some other forms of um, how much of your test code is actually being executed. That's the one coverage. The other coverage is something we see in the next slide is the coverage of your RTL code. So that's actually what your, what your test benches should cover. And the good news here is CocoDB doesn't reinvent the wheel here. Your simulator that you have currently is probably great capable already to collect all the types of coverage you might be interested in. Line coverage, statement coverage, toggle coverage, whatever um, might be of interest to you. These are collected just in a standard way by your simulator. The good thing about that is you can merge coverage from different test benches. So you can merge the coverage you might have created from your UVM test bench with the one from your uh, Cocoa DB test bench, since they're effectively all from the same simulator in the same format, whatever the simulator supports is also something that Cocoa DB can work with. And again, here we provide a slight convenience functionality, just type coverage equals one, we've seen that before. So in this case, it just collects both types of coverage. The last type of coverage is, sorry, is functional coverage. And uh, we see that actually as we move forward on the next slide. Indeed. So functional coverage and the ideas of functional coverage are heavily intertwined, even though they're not strictly required to be connected with constraint random verification. The verification approach that um, you're used to if you do a lot of UVM or other styles of verification. Um, it's also the, the verification approach that scares away a lot of people um, because it requires a pretty significant upfront investment in actually getting used to those verification approaches. So if we have a look at the next slide, we see that the important message to, to note here is that CocoDB can do constraint verification. It is not part of the core of CocoDB, but it's, it is an extension to CocoDB. And there is no technical restriction that says there has to be only one single way of doing constraint random verification or functional coverage. But there is a widely used extension to CocoDB called CocoDB coverage which implements system Verilog style constraint random verification with a very nice and interesting decorator syntax that fits in very nicely with the Python ideas, fits very nicely with the ideas of CocoDB. Um, it is uh, pretty well documented and you find the documentation in the link that I've just shown. Obviously, in the remaining 10 minutes, I'm gonna have a hard time going into all the details of constraint random verification. So in the next slide, we see a simple code snippet of how CocoDB coverage does couple points. And as I said before, they're done through decorators and we see them at a code snippet below. So in this case, we have a cover point. Um, we see a bit of binning and we see the arguments that are actually being put into those bins and covered. All of that 
and more, have a look at the CocoDB coverage documentation. It is very powerful and it used is used in large industry projects. So it's actually not just a toy example. So this is the good stuff. Let's have a look at some more integration examples and inspirations of how CocoDB can be used to give additional benefit to your projects. And these are a more or less random collection of pieces of code that I have seen and that I'm also not only have seen, but also am able to share. So there's a mostly open source um, project that we're going to have a look at. First of all, we're going to have a look at an example that is verifying a risk v CPU core. And if you want to verify a whole CPU core, you typically need a random instruction generator that gives you a randomly generated golden model of what the CPU is expected to do. And you want to write this golden model in a highly productive language and code to be uh, Python is totally um, capable and a good choice for that. And then of course you need a bit of glue to get the instructions you generated fed into the device on a test and get the resulting data typically on the memory bus or um, yeah, tweak on the memory bus, get that back. And the piece of glue code is something we see in the slides here. And I'm gonna leave you with those slides. I think they're gonna be shared at, uh, after this, this presentation so you can have a look at them, but also better look at the GitHub repository where this piece of code is contained. Looking at the next slide, we see another example that I found very, very interesting. And it's a use case that I've heard many people actually using CoQT before. And in many cases, your device on the test has been modeled before. Um, it's typically, if it's a DSP style device, you probably had a MATLAB model for that. And you want to now have an easy way to use your MATLAB model as the golden reference for your device on the test, which is then implemented um, for your FPGA or most, yeah, probably mostly for your FPGA, sometimes also for your ASIC. The good thing, and that's where the, where the ecosystem part comes into play, Many tools, many, many approaches that we use for creating those global models already have Python integrations that are pre-packed, that are ready to use, that are very productive to use. And in this case, MATLAB is no exception. So this piece of code has been shared with us on a chat channel from somebody that actually does that. And they just stripped out a couple lines of code in between, like five or 10 lines, um, but that's all you need to interface MATLAB, run MATLAB, run your golden model, feed those pieces of data into your device under test, get them back, check if the golden model matches, and then print up fast or fail. So that's pretty cool, and you can do similar things if you go for all the other ways of developing gold models, developing DSP style models. Um, NumPy is heavily used there, and extensions to that. So interfacing that, is super easy and highly productive. Another example where CocoDB is widely used, if you look at the next slide, is in projects that make use of some kind of trace or network functional. So if you have a FPGA design, for example, that gets some data over Ethernet, Ethernet packets of some kind, does some processing on them, um, you need to test that somehow. And the typical testing is that you have recorded traces of Ethernet packages in typically PCAP format. And there is a very convenient Python library called SkyP uh, that you can use to create and also read back those traces and feed them into a device and a test. And that's what we see in the next slide is a snippet of a project that does a network analyzer for, for 10G Ethernet. And in this case, it does XEStream on one side, and then it gets those packages from Skype and just feeds them into those XEStream packages. So interfacing all of those worlds is super easy with um, CoPDB because you get that um, existing ecosystem that you can leverage. And have a look at the next slide. Finally, uh, not Finally, but um, for a very exciting example that I find is USB verification, typically a rather challenging um, piece of IP to verify. 
And um, I'm by no way saying this is the, the solution to verify all your complex USB 3.0 point something uh, IP. But what we see here is a open source approach that has been published by Antmicro, and you find a whole write up in their blog that I've just linked there. Um, that uses CurpyDB to verify a USB 1.1 um, IP core. And what you see here as well is the nice integration into all of those existing pieces of infrastructure. Like on a screenshot on the bottom right, you see a Wireshark window open that is able to just uh, look at those USB traces without you having to transform them in, in any fancy way. Finally, on the next slide, if you said UVM is the best thing since sliced bread, and I totally want to make use of that class library and make sure that uh, the learnings in the UVM development are also available in my CurkyDB projects, there is a way to do that. There is a port of the UVM class library to Python and to CurkyDB, and you find that on the link that I've shown here. It's a very impressive project and might be a very interesting starting point if you have existing UVM engineers or are interested in actually reusing the methodology behind UVM, but uh, still want to leverage those ecosystem benefits that CurkyDB gives you. With that, let's have a look at the last slide. CurkyDB is a way to bring joy back to verification, to your verification projects. Verification is software and you need to be productive in writing that verification. How could it be is a way to be highly productive in that by using Python as a high level software language. It allows you to focus on verification and reuse everything else. Reuse your golden models, reuse transaction checkers, reuse all of PyPy and the whole ecosystem of question and answers that you can find on Stack Overflow and wherever you look on the internet. Reduce your development time, iterate quickly and leave your simulator open. Important to note, make Coco to be yours. You can pick a methodology or none at all, whatever you prefer, whatever makes you most productive, whatever helps you to get most out of your um, verification time. With that, enjoy Coco to be, and I'm ready for questions. On the next slide, you'll see a couple more references to documentation, to mailing lists, to chats. So if you have questions, that's the way to reach out to us. Thank you. Well, thank thank you, Philip. Uh, that was uh, a, a great introduction to uh, CoKTB and uh, really demonstrated its, its versatility. So, so many thanks for that. Um, we, we've had several questions come in, uh, so uh, I'm going to try and get through as, as many as I can in, in the uh, in, in the three or four minutes we have remaining. Uh, we, we may overrun slightly, so uh, let me wade straight in. Um, uh, Philip, uh, does CoKTB support system Verilog interfaces? So, I'm not quite sure what the question is asking. So, system Verilog interfaces at all are a HDL construct. So, um, whatever your simulator is able to simulate, if they're able to simulate system Verilog interfaces, could be used fine with that. Um, and I'm actually not quite sure how they're exposed on the on the VPI boundaries, that's the boundary we're looking at, but I'm reasonably sure they're just normal signals, so you should be able to access them just like any other uh, signal or port in, in, in CocoTB. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next one is, uh, uh, does CocoTB support other simulators? Yes, so if you look at the CocoTB documentation, you find all the list of, all the simulators that it supports, but I guess the quick answer is all of them that are used in normal settings. That's brilliant. Okay. Um, and off the back of that, we've got someone asking, uh, can I use a mix of CocoTB and uh, System Verilog uh, test bench, for example? Absolutely. And uh, I think you should. Um, exam the example we've seen here is where I generated a clock in CocoTB. That's typically not a good thing to do. So it's totally encouraged to write some pieces of your verification code, probably in System Verilog, to make sure this runs inside the simulator and doesn't um, require us to go back to Python. But then if you have transactions 
that you want to feed into CocoDB and feedback, um, that's where CocoDB comes in. Same goes for existing verification code that might already drive some transactions for some pieces of IP, but not the others. Use that, use your existing test bench for those, use your existing agents and uh, all the infrastructure you might have, and just use CocoDB for some others. Okay, brilliant. Um, uh, next question was, uh, can we interactively debug our code during simulation via our simulator of choice? Yes, so as long as you're in the simulator, you can use all the, the, the tooling that your simulator provides you. So I'm not quite sure actually what the what what kind of interactive debug is, is meant here. So um, obviously you see all the, the signals that we've seen in the screenshot um, and so on while you're in the in the simulator environment. Uh, if the question was, can you into, uh, debug the Python code? Of course, you can do that as well. You can, of course, the most straightforward, stupid, but still very effective way is inserting prints in your code and you see them in a console. Or if you want to go more fancy, you can still um, attach a Python debugger to your code and have that run next to that. There are examples of how to do that in the CodeDB documentation. Okay, brilliant, thank you. Um, uh, Next question is, does CocoTB work with, with multi-stage compilation? Uh, in other words, can we separate the RTL test bench environment and test compilations from each other uh, and uh, uh, and then kind of look at them separately or, or together? So, yeah, so can, can it work in a multi-stage compilation situation? I'm not quite sure I get that question completely right. So um, maybe just follow up with you, uh, me via email. I think the important thing to note here is Python is interpreted. So there is no kind of compilation step there. Um, so this is effectively a question that only touches the, the Verilog code or the VHDL code as it is run in the simulator. And again, there the question it, um, goes back to what the simulator supports. Okay, that's great. Yes, uh, yeah, and just follow up on your comment there, Philip. Uh, if we don't get time for all the questions, or uh, uh, there are several here, uh, we will be uh, we'll be sending uh, sending the, the presentation and, and links afterwards anyway. So um, uh, we have got a few more minutes. So um, uh, we've had two that come in very similar. Uh, they both relate to simulation speed. Uh, is there any simulation speed impact by driving the interface signals from Python? Yes and no. So there is obviously a speed impact that you pay for bridging this gap. So once the simulator has kind of yielded, once you are reaching that rising blockage, for example, and go back to Python and um, going back so that this, this interface costs you. It doesn't cost you much, but it costs you. And this is also the reason why I said it makes sense to make sure that you drive transactions that are sufficiently high level and don't drive the clock through CocoDB, even though you can do that. And it's also important to note that CocoDB is fast enough for many reasonably small test benches to do a signal level testing there. Um, beyond that, there is no impact in your simulator performance. So as long as the control is with the simulator, as long as that is running, CocoDB stays out of the way, Python stays out of the way, and you're only limited by the simulation performance that you get out of your simulator. So that's typically your hardware. Great, thank you. Um, a great one here. Uh, is it possible to use CocoTB with the uh, recently launched open source uh, BlueSpec system Verilog? I'm sorry that I probably can't fully answer that question, but the easy answer would be if your system Verilog, uh, if your BlueSpec system Verilog simulates in your simulator of choice, you can also use CocoDB with that. But I'm actually not quite sure how the simulation story at the moment works with the BlueSpec. Okay. Okay. Again, we could follow up with uh, with separate emails on any of this. So, Absolutely. Um, yes. Uh, so, uh, yeah, good. <laughs> uh, does CocoDB care uh, whether, whether or not the simulation tool is 32 or 64 bit? No, it works in both. So it works in Active HDL, which as far as I know is a 32-bit only simulator. Um, it requires you only to make sure that you install Python and um, yeah, mainly Python in a 32-bit version as well. So the two need to match, but that's the only requirement. 
Okay, great. Um, well, we we we, just, uh, we are kind of running out of time now. We have slightly gone over. Uh, uh, probably just one one last question, which I can answer myself here. Is that uh, uh, comments come in that uh, Philip, great presentation. Uh, can you make the slides available? So yes, uh, yes is the answer to that. We will be uh, sending out uh, links to a recording of this presentation, uh, and we will uh, answer uh, any any other questions that there are about five or six others that uh, that we, we we don't have time for now. Uh, so uh, it, uh, it it really just uh, remains for me to uh, thank you uh, for your. Uh, for your time, Philip. Uh, greatly appreciated uh, for your presentation at Coco TB. Uh, use Python and bring joy back to verification. Um, again, we will we will kind of follow up with with, with any questions we didn't get to answer on the presentation. Uh, uh, this brings us to the end of today's webinar. Uh, so to learn more about Aldex Riviera Pro, uh, screenshots of which were shown in uh, uh, Philip's presentation, or, or any of the companies or EDA solutions, we invite you to visit our website, aldex.com, or email us at sales at oldec.com. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I've been your host, Richard Warrilow, and I hope you can join us on future webinars.